Chapter 23. He will not come into the city. The wall was dark with the defenders of the city. Their weapons were indeed in their hands, their swords, their spears and arrows, their oiled silk torches, fires burning at the ready. So had it been with the defenders of Lachish. What good had it done them? Taharka stood with Hezekiah, Amos at his side, the king's honor guard close by. He had come out to stand against them. If he must die, he would die like the people of the city. The streets were not empty now. They surged below the wall, men, women, children, clubs, rocks, knives, homemade slings. They pressed toward the west gate as if they were the attackers, eager for the assault. But Taharka, from the wall, could see the real assailants across the open space, the black tents, the siege engines and chariots, the battering rams, the horses. Once he had stood among them and watched their work of terror. Now he faced them. Now he was their prey. Soon they would close in. Soon they would blot out the rising sun. They had been given sword and spear. He remembered Mbuta. This is a spear, little nephew. You grasp it so. The Ka of Mbuta would stand beside him. He would give it no cause for shame. Why did they not move? The sky was red now. It was time. They were ready for attack. The chariots positioned. The rams in place. The horses drawn up. Surely they were ready. Something was wrong. Where is their infantry? whispered Amos. Yes. Where were the men? The horses were there. Where were the riders? The siege engines were there. Where were the men who would sweat and strain to drive them forward? And the silence. Where were the shouts of the commanders? Hezekiah, the sweat on his brow, muttered to himself, What is this? Some trickery? But there was movement among those black tents. Carts and wagons were being drawn up. Loading, said Amos. What are they loading? Something strange was happening. What use did they have for those carts? The cold fear of the unknown took hold of the men on the wall, spread in waves to the people below. What strange and terrible thing did they have in store for them? The silence was broken. Someone was shouting, out there in the open space between the city and the camp, a wild piercing cry. A young boy, a shepherd, was running across the fields, one lone young boy. They could not make out the words. A trick, a trick, hissed Amos, and a trick, a trick, ran from mouth to mouth among the soldiers. One of them had strung his bow, notched his arrow. Hold, shouted the king, and hold your weapons, ran a long line among the captains, and now they could understand the words. It's over. Open the gate. Let me in. Throw him a rope, said the burly captain of Hezekiah's guard. Jerusalem might fall to the battering rams, not some Assyrian deviltry. Let them work for their victory. A line was dropped, and the boy, strong and lithe from his work in the pastures, clambered the height of the wall. He was surrounded by the soldiers, shoved roughly from one to the other. An Assyrian spy. What's his story? It had better be good. Take him to the king. They threw him, trembling and terrified, at the feet of Hezekiah. He looked up, forgetting his fear for a moment, in amazement and awe. You're the king? Get up, boy, said Hezekiah. Say what you came to say. Still trembling, a little unsteady, the boy stood up. It's over, he mumbled, the words muffled by the clamor rising around them. Speak up. This time it was almost a scream. It's over. Suddenly everything was still. What are you saying, said Hezekiah. Who are you? They drafted me into their camp, said the boy, to clean up after them. I saw what's happening. There's sickness there. They're all sick. They're dying. They're dropping like flies. They're moving out. It could be true, broke into Harka. I saw it myself last night. They looked from one to another. They couldn't take it in. But Taharka gazed out across the field, and then, in that stunned silence, he heard it, thin and faint, carried by the wind, the keening and the cries of the stricken Assyrians. And in the distance he could see what was being loaded onto those carts, the bodies of men, the sick, the dying, and the dead. For just a moment he was stricken with horror. He should go to them. He should be there. It was his calling to help them. Surely a real physician could do something against that terrible wave of death. But Amos was looking at him with a look that reminded him, just a little, of Shabbataka. Don't be a fool, he muttered, and Hezekiah had closed his eyes. He will not come into the city, he whispered. Then he opened them wide. The words came in a great shout. He will not come into the city. The word had spread among the people from mouth to mouth, and the voices rose around them. It's over. A plague has struck them down. It's over. Praise to Yahweh. They're moving out. We're going to live. He will not come into the city. A captain of a hundred pushed his way through to the king. My lord the king, there's trouble at the west gate. Hezekiah knew without words. The people of Jerusalem had suffered greatly. There were few who had not lost friends or family to the Assyrian drive, and before that, to their demands for human tribute. 
They had been trapped and starved, shut in from their fields and vineyards, like birds in a cage. They wanted revenge. They were burning for revenge, as if swept by a great fire. Hold them back, said Hezekiah. I don't know if we can. They're trying to break through. They're tearing out doorposts for rams. I'll go to them, said Hezekiah. They won't turn against me now. This is the Lord's work, not ours. And gathering his cloak around him, he laughed softly. It was over. They had loaded their dead and their dying onto their carts and wagons and moved out. They were gone. The echoes of the moans and the cries were still. Once, across the fields, Taharka had seen a lone figure lifted onto a rich litter and carried away. He had recognized the brightness of the robe, the Rab Shaka. He had seen it raise a fist toward the city. We will be back, it seemed to say. But Taharka's death day had come and gone, and he was still alive. The people of the city were still alive. They had held back from pursuit. Hezekiah had been right. If they would not turn against him and surrender, they would not turn against him in this. Jackal's work, said Amos contemptuously. But later, when the sun was high, the gates had finally been thrown open and they had poured out. Out into the fields of barley, to the spring of Gihon, to the orchards and the vineyards, cartloads of grain to the grinding stones, cartloads and armloads of vegetables and fruits to the city. They were going to live. Figs and dates and honey cakes, platters of leeks and root vegetables were brought to the table of the king that evening for the first time in many weeks. The shepherd boy had provided a ram from his father's herds. Taharka found that he could eat very little. He, after all, had not been suffering from hunger, but he had not slept for two days and a night. He wanted only to sleep. And later, as the sun went down, he wandered outside his chamber to the roof of the house of the king. Down there, in the streets, he could hear the voices. Not far off, there was music. People were dancing. If he could have moved that far, he would have gone down and joined them. The last thing he thought before he fell asleep was, I'm going to live. Sleep wrapped him like a dark cloak. And then suddenly, he was wide awake. It was not morning. The moon was high in the sky. Something had startled him out of that darkness, his eyes wide, his muscles tense, his hand already feeling for the short sword that still hung at his side. Someone was on the roof. A man. He was leaning over, coiling the rope he must have used to scale the wall of the king's house. An assassin, thought Taharka, not quite believing it. From where? Sent by whom? And who was his target? Silent as a cat, Taharka inched his way into the darkness behind a corner of the wall. The sword was in his hand now. The man straightened, the rope slung over his shoulder. He shook his head as if confused and looked around him, unsure of what to do next. Then, hesitating a little, he made his way toward the entrance that led to Taharka's chamber. Taharka was behind him. The point of his sword was at his back. Don't move, he said. The man froze still as death. For some reason, Taharka did not call out for a guard. Now, he said, turn around. Slowly, very slowly, the man obeyed. And then, to Taharka's amazement, he shielded his eyes with his hands and fell to his knees. But not before Taharka had seen his face. He was not a man of the city. He was a black man, a man from the Egyptian Southland. There was a scar, not very old, just over his left eye.